So this is a new interview that they did. Uh, apparently, people told me that it was a very good interview. They covered a lot of things that were very important. Uh, obviously, they're probably going to talk about, of course, um, transmog, uh, RP realm, uh, phasing concerns, and uh, the new storm mount. So uh, let's get into this and see what they're see what they're going to say. I never noticed that, but music actually is good. It's not a secret that the current mood of the community is not the best. Like, um, as a fan side, we are reading a lot mm -hmm. of comments, watching videos and so on. And to be... Look at Ian's hair. That's the hair of somebody... Oh, louder? Okay, I'll turn it up, sorry. Um, that's the hair of someone who's had to read comments of people complaining about PvP vendors. And then whenever there were PvP vendors, people complaining that they couldn't find them. Same here. Yeah, that's basically my hairline. To be honest, it's really frustrating to see the negativity about almost every aspect of the game. Okay. Especially because we do work with such a passion about what you do and, and stuff like that. And um, what do you think? Why is this this extreme since the release of Battle for Azure? That's a good question. Why do you because think people are mad? we don't really understand why it is like this. <laughs> I don't know if it, you if it's yeah. easy to answer or if you want to answer or something. It, it's definitely not easy to answer. It's something that I I spend a lot of time thinking about myself. You know, it's um, it's frustrating and, and honestly painful even. You know, yeah, uh, we all of us who are making want. this game. Part of the joy of working in the industry that we do and getting to work on a game like World of Warcraft is you know, our goal is to make people happy. We want to we want to bring people pleasure, fun experiences, and escapes, and just a world of magic. Mm. Magic. And it's good. I think. I want to be a wizard. We're human. We make mistakes. We're not perfect. Yep. We try to admit, you know, recognize those mistakes, learn from them, and improve things going forward. That's good. Um, if there's one thing that I could stress to the community, it's that God, do we care? Like we care deeply about this. The everyone on the team, 300 people on the team, we are out there on Reddit and Twitter and the f official forums and fan sites reading all the comments. And, and we understand that a lot of it, you know, comes from a place of, it, it comes from a place of pain almost. It comes from a place of passion. I, I think really, like, why people are frustrated is like, you can have something like PvP, and PvP vendors or like, like Titan forging, for example. Or, or like removal of master. I think PvP vendors are probably the easiest and least contentious example, where pretty much everyone like there are some people that like Titan forging. There are some people that don't like master loot, right? But there's almost nobody that doesn't like PvP vendors. And the reason why people think that they're not listening is because there can somehow be a unified feeling in the entire community of we want something that the game has had for ten years to come back, and they say no it seems like they're not listening, right? And like, I, I get if the answer is no, but I mean, at a certain point, it's like how many people need to want this for it to happen? It, you know what I mean? It, it's just like, come on. Um, people feel like there's this game they love, that they have a deep connection to, and there's something about it that's going in a direction that they don't like, that's frustrating to there, them. They yeah. find themselves not looking forward to logging in the way they used to, Yeah. and lash out comes from a place of emotion. <clears throat> and that's yeah. a testament to the deep connection people have to World of Warcraft as a game, and it's a it's a challenge for us to to fix it. I mean, and I think one of the one of the challenges with World of Warcraft, that's true. it's actually touched on this recently in our, the most recent live Q and A, is there are so many there are very diverse audiences and playstyles that exist and coexist within Azeroth in WoW, and often you know when players may accuse us of being out of touch. It's not that we don't understand their concerns and don't understand what they would like the game to be. Yeah. The problem is that we're also trying to keep in mind another half dozen groups of players who may want the game to be different things and often directly. How, how are you ever gonna like how how's that how's that ever gonna work? I mean, functionally, like how, how can you have? It's like playing whack a mole, and there's like fifty moles. Like it's like you go to the you go to the arcade and there's nine and you're overwhelmed, but there's fucking fifty moles. Like there's too many fucking moles. You can't make every target audience happy. It's impossible. If you do that, you make five people happy and fifty people mad. 
that's what keeps happening is you just keep trying to make they're basically rotating they're like we're gonna make five people here happy and then everybody else mad but don't worry in like you know six months or a year it's gonna be your turn to be happy and then we're gonna make them mad instead and so they're just making everybody mad all all in basically a rotation and and just like that's not working I mean, like why would you even like I just, I, like it, it, it's a it's a mistake to even try to go in that direction I think Posing things and we're also thinking about the long-term future and how these systems and how these changes are going to play out in the long run now yeah. i don't blame players for this you know players have every right to just focus on their own experience if you if all you care about is high-end pvp i don't expect you to you know yeah. say okay I'm, I'm having less fun but i'm okay with this because some other player out there is having more fun as a result yeah I mean, it's okay to be upset but the only thing i would like to stress is we care. Like this isn't this isn't a situation where we're sitting back and we're like, okay, you know, well, whatever. This is something that actively is occupying a large amount of our attention, and we want nothing more than for you know everyone to be as happy as possible. And then, Good. in terms of why, parts of it are also just. And I, I don't mean this to sound like in any way an excuse or deflecting They're blame. They're just mad to be mad. I think the internet in general is a place that's yep. become a bit more polarized. A bit more prone to you know just extreme viewpoints and it's more about getting anger and opinions out there and less about finding common ground and looking for places of agreement and i think you see that across a wide range of subjects you know, yeah, politics that's... certainly and so i think all of those things i think that's true i mean it's definitely true uh, i remember like i learned in marketing class and i was still in business school that you're nine times more likely to get feedback from a negative encounter or a negative experience a customer has than a positive experience and so this isn't something that's just like the internet. I mean, this is like a codified, like logical thing that are in books. And it, it's very clear that, yeah, obviously people that are mad are gonna be more likely to give feedback than people who are happy because people who are happy just shut the fuck up and they don't care and they just go do their own thing and they play the game and they enjoy it on their own. I, I think that's, that's absolutely like true, but to the extent that like, the feedback is like universally negative, especially with like certain things or not universally, but like 95%, you know, like negative, 99% negative. And the people that are, are okay with it are usually doing different things in the game or not really playing the game seriously at all. Uh, I think that's really the concern. Like, I don't really know hardly any hardcore or high end players that are happy with the state of the game. I mean, you can say like the casual players are, or they're not. But I think really the reason they're happy or they're satisfied with the state of the game is because they don't experience the game in enough ways to be able to form an opinion about it one way or another. So if the game was the same as it used to be in Burning Crusade, they'd still be happy with it probably because they're not experiencing enough of the game to really be able to reach and hit those limitations to begin with. So it's like if you're playing in Classic WoW, you never really worried about, you know, like, oh man, attunements are really hard to make it to get into raids because you spent the entire time leveling up because you were a fucking kid and your mom only let you get on the computer for two hours. So you never really were able to hit those limitations to begin with. And I think that's what a lot of casual players do now is they just go and they do world quests and never really hit those walls that the high end players hit. So if Blizzard changes those walls, I don't think that would really affect the casual player base because they're not interfacing with them to begin with. Um, it seems like one of the bigger complaints of the community was the endgame itemization. On the one hand, the community needs to uh, catch up things for new players and alts. And on the other hand, it feels like there are no real advantages for players who are playing the game real intense day after day. And yes, of course, we are playing the game to have fun with, our, with or without our friends, for example in raids and PvP. But good gear progression should also be a part of the game. Um, and we would like to know if uh, why why there was this change between uh, classic Brain Crusade and stuff where you had this progression, if you know what I mean. I, I hope. Yes, it, okay. yes, exactly. Okay. okay. I mean, so I, I think that's, to some extent, that's, hey, that's that's the way the game has been really for the last 10 years. I think you're, you're right in calling out classic and Burning Crusade as a different era. Yeah. I think really it was Wrath of the Lich King when, you know, Trial of the Crusader came out in patch 3.2 back then, and that gear was a strict replacement. See, even he knows where the breakpoint was. He knows. TOC was it. That was it. The game stopped being good in TOC. And I actually, I don't want to say it stopped being good, right? But it stopped. 
it, like, I, I don't know, like, it stopped growing in terms of being compelling, right? I, I don't know, like, exactly how to phrase it to where it's actually completely accurate, but TOC was a turning point for the game, and I think it was a turning point for the worst, right? You had TOC completely invalidate everything that came from Ulduar. The boss fights were generally less complex and less compelling, right? Uh, the raid in general was... I mean, very clearly, there was less work put in Trial of the Crusader than Ulduar. It completely invalidated, invalidated all content before that except for Valinir. It was just a complete fucking mistake to do that. And then after that, TOC was the first raid that you had four different difficulties of the same raid. You had 10-man normal, 10-man heroic, 25-man normal, 25-man heroic. And at that point, every single time that a new tier would come out... All of the gear from the previous tier would be completely replaced and this didn't happen before then so an example for this is the uh the trial of the crusader dungeons right it dropped 200 and 213 item level gear which is the equivalent of nax ramus so you could take that gear and maybe buy a few badge gears uh, pieces of gear and just go right in a 10-man toc and skip old war completely and before then you weren't able really to do that to get into old war you still had to do nax to get into old war and that was the point where raids in the current expansion no longer mattered. There it was. TOC. It's important that gear matters. It's important that power matters. Yep. Progression feels great. He knows. But we also want the game to remain accessible to people who are joining a bit later or who are coming back. And that's... There's like eight or nine million people playing the game at that point. Like, how's it not accessible if there's that many people playing it? Like, the end game was accessible. The, the, the problem is you made the whole game around the end game. Like, the reason I've always thought vanilla was better than Burning Crusade is that there's more content in vanilla than just level 70 in Burning Crusade. You had, like, all the 60 stuff. You had, like, 40 dungeons that were integrated into leveling up and getting gear for 60 stuff. Th there was a lot more of, like, interplay that happens. And, like, in Burning Crusade, there's just 70, right? Which, for an in-game raider, is great. But for an MMO, I don't think it's as good. And, and in, in Wrath, that completely became the case in TOC. T TBC was fine. I thought TBC was incredible, okay? I love TBC. But I just thought Vanilla was better. It might, it might be my personal preference, but that's the way I'd like to see an MMO more than TBC. It's not just in the interests of those players, it's also in the interests of guilds. Like all through Burning Crusade, that period that you ask about, guilds complained bitterly about having to you know, go back and get people attuned in Serpent Shrine and Tempest Keep, yeah. and the fact that when they wanted to recruit a new raider or something. That, that's so true, because the story that I told yesterday about Cody, me having to go back and like get Cody the gear and everything, and like us doing that raid uh, on the weekend for like SSC and TK and we took them in there and we got them all the gear. The reason we did that is because people weren't keyed. So yeah, like this is the case. But I figure like, I, I think the keying runs were more fun. Like they were more positive than negative. At least it got people to like play with alts, to pug, it got high end players to play with low end or lower end players. It was better overall. When was coming back, they had to, you know, go back and do this content that felt irrelevant to them. Those were huge hurdles that actually made it much harder to recruit, made it much harder to get into rating as a whole. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, being able... I don't think it made it harder to get into rating because what it was is, like, you'd start in Tier 4 and you'd do Tier 4 content. So you weren't trying to get into Tier 6. Like, yeah, you're right. The attunements and everything made it hard to where if you were trying to get into rating, you didn't just immediately join a Tier 6 guild. You joined a Tier 5 guild. A tier four guild. You built your your time up. You killed Vosh. You killed Kale. Maybe you killed one boss in BT, and then you quit the guild after they gave you a good item, and you joined an actual guild that could kill Illidan. Right? It's not like you just go from point A to point Z. Back then, you went A, B, C, D, right, and whatever else comes after that. Uh, that's the way that it used to work. So yeah, obviously it made it harder to get into tier six guild, but it didn't make it harder to get into rating because people would still do Karazhan and Gruul's Lair and shit. Able to. You know, if you come back and you want to do Battle of Zarlor today, maybe you didn't play since September or you didn't play Battle of Azeroth at all, you can't just jump in right away. But there's clearly there's a faster path to get to the point where you'll be able to contribute than spending three or four months, you know, clearing Uldir every week and doing Mythic Plus. Um, very recently, I would say, Who would spend Tides three of to Vengeance, four months? That, that there was kind of an exceptional case there where 
that patch introduced catch-up mechanisms designed to get people ready for Battle of Dazar lore. Yeah. But Battle of Dazar lore didn't open until this week, in large part because of the holiday season. And that was just a timing issue. Uh, I think it's very likely that in Rise of Ashara and the next next tier, we'll see the raid open immediately after the patch, maybe just a couple of weeks after. So that, there won't be this be large good. gap. And so I, I agree that, you know, having... And that would also be good because people are, like, so cynical now. They assume that the reason they postponed Battle of Dazara lore was so they could extend people's subs an extra month, right? And it's like, I'm not, I'm not fully convinced that's not true, but them doing it to where the raid comes out within a month of the patch, I think is good even for them, because then people just don't come back, and they don't even get a chance to play the raid, and they unsub because there's nothing for them to fucking do. It's a double-edged sword. Catch up the Tides of Vengeance catch-up mechanisms in place when the only current raid content was Old Year felt like maybe, yeah, we were giving away a bit too much compared to the raid, but that was more of a one-time thing than a long-term philosophy change. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, we cool, know thanks. that you talked about the Valor points yesterday in your question and answering. Um, it was about upgrading gear pieces and item progression yes. and stuff. But okay. we would like to know why there is no different currencies anymore to purchase gear, like um, a bit comparable to the option of buying Ezrae pieces now in Battle for Arthros. Yeah. And um, because that's that's something cool. You just work for something and you can just buy Good an question. item every week or mm -hmm. two. Um, yeah, why, why don't we have something like that anymore? Yeah, I mean, so we yes, we have the Titan Residuum yeah. for Azerite armor. Um, in you know, in Legion, we had Nether shards and you know the Veiled Argonite on Argus as part of the patch content. That's not the same, dude. Like you know, it's not the same, man. Like what are you talking about? Like you're gonna say a vendor that I mean, like you played vanilla and Burning Crusade and Wrath. Like what are you talking about? The this fucking random trinket vendor is the same as the badge vendor in Wrath. Like give me a fucking break. It's not the same. Everybody knows it's not the same. People don't want to fucking gamble eight different trinkets, spend all day in Argus picking up boxes and killing the same rare spawns that they've been killing for a month so they can identify a trinket and have it be a haste mastery trinket that they don't even fucking need. Like, that's, a, that's not the same thing. There. The Residium is good. But the Nether Shards and Veiled Argonite are absolutely not. They were not good. Uh, it's not. It's definitely not something we've completely moved away from. I think ideally there is a, there is a place for that. We'd like to strike a balance where there is some loot that you get randomly. You know, you kill a boss and hopefully your item drops. And then on the other hand, you have this system of guaranteed progression that you can work towards through currencies. Um, Good. We... That worked in Burning Crusade and Wrath. That's literally exactly what they had. They had the badge vendor that you could work towards pieces of gear and you could get those pieces of gear. And then also there were bosses that dropped gear at the same time and you could mix and match based off of what you got lucky with and what you wanted to focus on. That's what you guys already fucking had. Like, what do you mean we're going to do this? This is what you've been doing. We probably can do more for that, particularly on the raid and dungeon side. And I think on the PvP side right now, Conquest provides that guaranteed gear track where no matter what, you know that as you earn Conquest, you will earn all of these rewards, which is then complemented by end of match rewards and your weekly chest rewards if you're doing rated PvP that give you a chance at exciting upgrades. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe it's a bit early to ask this question, but um, if you could change two or three things prior BFA release, what would it be? Um, it, that, that's an interesting question. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It depends on how far back I can go with my time machine. You know, I, I think a yeah. lot of what we did in eight, in Tides of Vengeance reflects the lessons we learned and some of the regrets from the launch of Battle for Azeroth. It's changes to systems like islands, like on expeditions, like Azerite armor. Yeah. Um, a lot of tuning there. And so I think a lot of a lot of those concerns There's not gonna be an revolve answer. around you know the initial tuning and structure of those systems. Uh, going back even further, I, I think yeah there, there are some more fundamental issues with that with the Azerite armor system that players have done a good job of pointing out and that we are looking to it was fucked. really pivot away from and it, it was correct Come on, with man. Rise of Ashara. I, I think I'm we we're happy with it. From a, from a customization perspective, from the perspective of making items that have greater depth that are more interesting than you know our traditional helms or shoulder pieces that just have crit or haste or haste or mastery, mm -hmm. where you can actually well we had that though. Like we had well, look we had that. Just a second, well, let me show you guys. See, um, 
where is it where's one of my oh there's one right there can you guys see that one no you can't just a second look we had this see we had uh like we had that with like meta sockets and we had oh look at this one had enchants on the helmet we we are already had these this this already happened horse we had sockets and all of the gear the enchants and uh, that like the enchants on weapons, the dancing steel. Like, come on! Like, what do you mean? Like, this is something they, they've taken the customization out. They've taken the depth out of the items, and that was intent. Like, how can you say you want to put it in there? Whenever you said you wanted to uh, choose from a number of different options, and especially with the new system with five rings and tides of vengeance, you can pick many more different combinations, and you know, at, emphasize one aspect of your class versus another. That's, I think, an interesting and successful system. The progression of unlocking those traits through earning artifact power, I think, was a little bit of a mismatch with that system. And so that's why, as we look ahead to Rise of Ashara, we just want to keep the armor pieces fully unlocked and have a different avenue for progression in mm -hmm. the heart of Azeroth at artifact itself. Yeah, we are looking forward to it because it sounds really interesting. <laughs> um, that is our hope. Okay, yeah. let's talk about the, the uh, current stuff and the eight, patch 8.1. Um, sure. Season 2 has just begun and the new raid is a real blast. Although raid tests already have been fun, it was even more fun to play the encounters on the live servers. And, Except um, for Storm there and are a lot of new and unique mechanics, like the treasure guardian with his golems and traps and stuff like that. Good fight. What's your favorite fight in the new raid? If you can say something about that. Um, I'm yeah, I, I've only, I've obviously, yeah, other than internal testing, I've also just done it the one time with my guild this week. Uh, so at least from heroic mode, probably tied between opulence and mecha torque mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the treasure guard the i think that i i really like the way the split raid works out it reminds me of you know doing something like thorum back in old war exactly. a long time ago yeah. right where you have your separate group going down a hallway with their yeah, unique set of challenges um just very cool very cool flavor really integrates the environment and then mecha torque is just it's just a fun fight you're fighting the king of the gnomes and the whole I'll dynamic so. of frantically calling out what color people are to help them defuse their robots. Um, that's, you know, just a ton of fun and uh, a new aspect of communication. I don't know about that. Dude. I, I, I didn't it was like a pretty that. Cool fight. I was annoying. It's like the mechanics yeah. are, I, I don't know. I, I really like Mega Talk, okay. yeah. Um, in addition to the battle for Dazalara, sorry, I can't really pronounce his name. <laughs> ne neither can we. I'm sorry. Blame oh, the trolls. Okay, cool. <laughs> Um, there is also the smaller Crucible of Storm Raid in Season 2. Oh, can you yeah. expect it yes. to open with the release of Patch 815? And can you tell something about Oh, yeah, when, yeah, when does that like, come out? It's not the higher rate here, so what can we expect? Um, so, I th yeah, I think definitely that, that the Crucible serves as a bridge between Battle of Dazar Lore okay. and Rise of Ashara and the raid content that's going to come there. So I'd expect it to open later on during the tier. Okay. Not necessarily directly when 815 launches, but probably okay. not too long after that i think we'll see mm -hmm. uh, as far as the rewards the item level on that isn't isn't quite final yet i think we're going to look at where the player base is as a whole i mean it's only a two boss raid so it wouldn't surprise me if kind of like trial of valor was a little bit higher than emerald nightmare those two bosses drop slightly higher item level base gear compared to battle of desire lore oh, okay. but i think that's we'll, probably we'll make a that good final idea. decision when we see what the average item level of you know active raiders is at when it comes time to open the raid Okay, cool. Um, faction assault. That way, they know how to increase it by fifteen, and then make all the D Battle of Desire Lord gear irrelevant. Uh, I, I'm I don't know if that's going to happen or not, but I mean, like that kind of did happen, like with Emerald Nightmare. Like as soon as TOV came out, people just tried to get as much gear as possible from TOV, and Emerald Nightmare was like, ah, oh, fuck, we got to do this again. We hate this. That yeah, that's true. That's understandable. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks. Um, from Wallace to Legion, a lot of the talent trees changed from utility-oriented roles, where a lot of them were used in f a few situations or based on player preferences, to having many throughput roles with relatively few uh, utility roles. Hmm. If you know what I'm... Uh, uh, perhaps, yeah. perhaps, yes, I think. Um, how do you think that has worked out, and is it a design decision you'd consider revisiting? Um. Yeah, I'm not sure there was a conscious decision to move away from utility. Uh, is that even true? Like, let me look at my let me look at my talents here. Like, what what is what is considered utility? Like, this is utility. Uh, I mean, this is kind of utility too. Uh, this is like in a like uh, in between utility. I mean, 
Yeah, I mean, it seems like two of the rows are utility. That's a lot. Um, and I think throughput rows, part part of the value there is to give players control over Maybe it's some of their strengths classes. and weaknesses or just customizing the rotation a little bit. Do you prefer a more proc-driven gameplay style or do you want something that's simpler and more passive or do you want an all-new ability to include in your rotation? And so I think we can give players those choices that lets people find something that feels best for them within the given specialization. Mm -hmm. um, also, you know, for, for higher-end players, they'll be able to customize themselves to excel in different situations, depending on whether they're doing a dungeon or PvP or a specific boss encounter that favors a certain talent. Why is the mouse pointer on his um, forehead? Utility, you know, I think... Look at it. We've certainly tried to move away from mixing utility and throughput, because when we put a utility yeah. option against something that? that is just making you do more damage or heal more effectively, those often don't feel like interesting decisions. So that may be some of the changes that we've made. Um, other other aspects of it are just making sure that we're not homogenizing classes too much. That we're not if you know with one of the dangers with utility is if everyone has access to everything, then that's what happens. People in feel Mop. less special with their individual Yeah, that's tools. exactly what happened. And in so Mop. we've pulled away from some of the talents that were, you know, giving classes abilities that really were traditionally not you know that, that were more traditionally weaknesses. You know, someone has to be very mobile. Someone has to be yeah. less good at movement. You know, demon hunters and that, that's what happened in Mists of Pandaria. Like everybody had a heal, everybody had a DR, everybody had an immunity, everybody had a movement ability, everybody had everything, and it was too many fucking buttons. I understand a lot of people like Mists of Pandaria. I get it, but I think the 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 balance of like Cataclysm or something like that, or Wrath, was better overall for the game in making the classes feel more unique. Especially for people that aren't, like, super high-end players. Like, if you're a really high-end player, yeah, you fucking loved Mop, obviously, because you had a million different things you could do. But for most people, I think it was just too complex. Like, there were too many core rotational abilities and core abilities you needed to have that you had to think about. And it was just, it made it too difficult. That's my opinion. Looks are at the high end of the spectrum there, and classes like Death Knights or Paladins are a bit less mobile. They still have talents like yeah. Divine Steed or Death's Advance, but that's not supposed to be their strength. And so in the past, where maybe they had a few more movement options than really were appropriate for that class, that was something that was actually taking away from their identity. Mm -hmm. um, talking about talents, um, why did you convert so many baseline abilities and passives of different classes into talents? For example, Affliction Warlock's talents are 70% something we already oh, saw like boy. two extensions ago as baseline spells. Like, for example, Lingering Insanity and Shadow of Death. Yeah. See, this is like, this is a bad idea. That's true. Um, and I think this is a mistake that they made, is that it made it harder for people to learn other specs, because the more abilities that you have that are universal to your class and not exclusive to your spec, make it easier for you to go from one spec to another, because you're already used to dealing with a lot of the abilities that the spec has. And what they've done now is they basically have like 36, I think they've even said this, they've got 36 different classes now. It's impossible to fucking balance, and it's hard for people to go from, like, Fire Mage to Frost Mage because it's a completely different play style. Like, back in the day, you'd have Fire Blast as a Frost Mage, so you'd understand, okay, this is Fire Blast, and you'd have Arcane Explosion, and there was some overlap, and it would be easier for you to go from playing one spec to another. Now, it, I think, it's just too much difference between the specs, and people should, Blizzard should realize that a mage is still a mage. It's like, how are you going to not know how to do Arcane Explosion? Like, mages knew how to do Arcane Explosions for nine years, and then suddenly they just forgot? Come on. The next big thing is okay. going to be patch 8.2, and the biggest highlight on your presentation was Nasheta. But it was also a really cool surprise to see Me Meca Mechagon? Mechagon? Mm -hmm. how yes. Do you, I don't know. Yes, Can Mechagon. <laughs> okay. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Like, is it just a new mega dungeon or is it a new zone? And a mega so, dungeon? What are we going to do there? What? So, it, I think... Yeah, what is I'm, this? I'm, I have to apologize in advance. I'm probably not going to say too much more than what we said at BlizzCon. Mm -hmm. um, okay. But just to clarify, yes, Mechagon is a second smaller zone than Nashatar, which is the main zone for Rise of Ashara. Okay. There's, you know, a mega dungeon that is similar to Karazhan, just as we, again, as we said at BlizzCon. Um, I think, you know, we'll have a ton more information to share on all of the details there and what you're going to be doing, and what the rewards are, and what the story is. In the you know, not too distant future, I think after 815 is out and off PTR, mm -hmm. as we've, you know, come to expect, we'll probably see Rise of Ashara going up on the PTR not too long after that. 
and we'll have That's tons fast. of information to share at that point. That's real fast. Can we talk about mecha gnomes and allied races? <laughs> I mean, we we can you you can talk about it. I'm not sure I'm going to. <laughs> wow. I mean, there's 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 a lot that you know. I think it's always exciting to see people get interested in and speculate about what the next okay. allied race is going to be and say. what will be cool to play. Um, we still haven't you know necessarily finalized every single one of those decisions, so it's exciting to hear feedback from the community about what is most exciting to them. Okay. okay good. Um, it sounded like you want to try something new with Nasiatar or combine a lot of things from other endgame zones. At BlizzCon you said you uh, we yes. will see something new every day, most likely for a specific period of time. Could you give us some examples of how you want to achieve this? Something new every day. Um, uh, That's like a said, lot. Unfortunately, not quite yet. I think our focus right now is on you know 815 and getting that polished up and getting that into players hands okay um, we'll have a lot more to talk about, good. about the details of that but yes just to underscore what jeremy said at blizzcon you know i think the goal with nasjatar is to learn from everything that we've done in our past end game outdoor zones whether it's argus whether it's broken shore whether it's just standard end game world quests and level up and you know kind of improve upon and combine the best of all of those worlds mm -hmm. Uh, probably the question was too far into the future. Well, no, no, sorry no, no, no problem at all. Um, probably there are ra rares in treasure chests again on these two zones. Oh! And, uh, to be honest, treasure chests on Kudrias and Sandala are pretty boring because you what? just open yeah. them and you get a bit of war resources. And you See, this is like one of those little fucking things that nobody thinks about. But back in vanilla WoW, Whenever you were questing and killing some wolves, and you saw a spider, and you killed the spider, and you turned to your right, and there was a fucking chest, there was a big silver treasure chest, you felt like a fucking winner, okay? Even now, if I see a vanilla WoW treasure chest, I feel better about that than if I see one for a level 120, because I know what that's going to have. It's going to be fucking boring. Treasure chests should be treasure chests. Like, they're not anymore. They're just fucking boring, dude. And, like, I, 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 like, and there's, like, an add-on that just tells you where all the treasure chests are. And you just follow the add-on. You go from one chest to another chest. It's like, how can you fucking make it that treasure chests, opening treasure chests, seems like work? They need to make special, original, unique treasure chests. Like the ones in Argus. Am I still in Argus? No, I'm not in Argus anymore. But like in Argus, like they had treasure chests. What would you open them up and get? You would get Veiled Argonite. Literally a gray item. And you would maybe get a piece of transmog gear. Which two of the three pieces of... Uh, two of the three sets of transmog sets in Argus were recolors of a terrible set that was added in WAD with a garrison building. So yeah, let's, you know, like, come on, man. Like, let's get some better treasure chests in here. I want to see a massive golden shining treasure chest that whenever you open it up, it has a mount in it. It has like 15,000 gold. It has uh, two BOE epic items and it has some other unique thing that like you can only get in the treasure chest, right? It's like a massive, like a really, really cool like helmet or like a, a golden crown or something fucking awesome like that. That's what I want to see, like a golden sword that's just like solid gold. That would be fucking cool. Yeah, massive big dick treasure chest. Yeah, a legendary treasure chest. Exactly. Sharding abuse? Oh, yeah, we can't make the game fun for everyone because 99% are going to be just fine, but there's that 1% that might abuse it, so hey, we can't do it. See, this is what I was talking about before with the 50 whack-a-moles. Yeah, obviously somebody like me is going to abuse the treasure chest. I'm going to be opening up a legend, legendary treasure chest every five fucking seconds because I'm going to be asking everybody to stand there and invite me and invite me, and I'll get the treasure chest. Yeah, of course. Oh, so Blizzard shouldn't do it because of me? Blizzard shouldn't do it because somebody else wants to abuse it? Who gives a fuck, man? Like, they can't make the game around a handful of people that just want to play it in some kind of a weird, convoluted, contrived way. Right? They have to make the game fun for most people. And going around and knowing what's going to be in the chest before you open it isn't fucking fun. Don't really need them. Uh, rares and treasure chests are not really rare True. at all. And there is no reason for us players yeah. to open them. If we want. There have been times where I've walked by a treasure chest and I'm like, that'd be a waste of time. I'm not going to pick that up. I never do that in Vanilla WoW. Even now. I go through a vanilla wild zone, I see a treasure chest, it doesn't fucking matter. 
if I see a level 20 treasure chest, I will go and I will click on it. Because you never fucking know. In the past, it was always a good feeling to find a chest or a rare enemy. Like, I, I remember in... Um, uh, in Wallet of Dreno, when we first just visited the zones and everywhere were rare spawns and you killed them the they first suck. time and it was like, wow, there is a rare and stuff like that. But now it's just like, oh, look there. No, it's the first time. Like, I remember I made videos like at the beginning, because as soon as I got the WAD alpha or the WAD beta, I went on there and I saw all these rare spawns and I was like, oh my God, wow. And I killed them and I was going to make videos about them. And then I just realized it's like this guy just respawned. I mean, it's just, it's just respawning. Like, I thought this was a rare spawn. How's it rare if he respawns every 30 seconds? Rare for who? Like, come on. There is a star on the mini-map. <laughs> um, and do you think we can see some more really rare things in the future again? That are yes. more exciting? <laughs> so, okay, so... I, I agree with your criticism completely. I, I think the treasure, like treasures, were better in Warlords. I think there were some, there were some problems with no, they you weren't know, finding a, a pixel that was a, you know, a single. A what the fuck do you mean they were better in Warlords? They're the same fucking thing. That's whenever you guys made the system. Like, how are they better in Warlords? The only reason that she thought they were better in Warlords is it was the first time. You know, now we've got it the third time. We know what's gonna be in the chest. What were in the chest in Warlords? Fucking nothing. What were in the chest in Legion? Fucking nothing. Well, unless you got a legendary out of it. But what was in the chest in BFA? Fucking nothing. Okay? There was no reason to do any of these. Like, here's the thing, right? You just fucking make it to where the treasure chests don't always spawn. Like, you can have some that are always there to make, you know, for like the Timeless Isle. I was thinking it was the first time they did it, was in a Timeless Isle where there are like guaranteed treasure chest spawns. But beyond that, you need to make some badass, like, huge, like, you know, these, like, giant, like, fucking molten core Firelands caches that look like you're opening up the fucking Ark of the Covenant to find Noah's Ten Commandments. That's what I want to fucking see. Ring, the bottom of a riverbed where you have to find the exact right pixel to click to loot the treasure. But having them tell more of a story, more varied rewards... That, that, that was a better system, and it's something we'd like to move back to in the future. Um, when it comes Good. to rares, those are tricky. I think we haven't really had true rares since Mr. Pandaria. I think even in Warlords, in a world where you can Let's join cross-server groups, I mean, even sh even sharding notwithstanding, the second you can join cross-server groups, which opens up tons of gameplay, the right way to hunt for true rare spawns often ended up being just server hopping. I remember back in Warlords, when we had rares in Tanan Jungle, people wouldn't yeah. actually move around looking for them. They would just sit at their spawn location yeah. and look for groups to join that had them up. So, so the solution to that is to just remove it. Like, was it really game breaking that people made a raid and they just sat around at the uh, at, at at Pound Fist or wherever the fuck his name was, or the guy in the the bird guy? Did it matter? Who cares? Like, it, it, it's, it's not a big deal. It's still excitement. Like, oh, man, the guy's up. Let's go over there. I mean, like, yeah, it, it's kind of contrived. Like, yeah, it's weird. It's not the way that it was intended. But it's still better than nothing. That's the thing. It's like, oh, people are using this in the wrong way, so we're going to take it out of the game. Well, at least some people used it in the right way. Now nobody gets it. That those are some of the challenges that we face when trying to, you know, create that type of gameplay. It's something we're looking to do and actually may start to experiment with again in Rise of Ashara and beyond. But I, I agree with you that there was something very cool Speaking about of that experience spawns. of a truly rare spawn that you come across and that's just exciting to see. Okay, cool. I, I didn't get them out. Another thing that uh, people are talking about very often. Um, are we going to see something like the Mage Tower in Ashatar or maybe at oh, some further future? So that is a good question. Class-specific solo yeah. challenges? That's a very good question. I think we were very happy with how the Mage Tower turned out in Legion. It's it something was awesome. We'd love to, we, we, yes, it's something we'd love to do again in the future. Uh, I think good. we don't want to turn it into this formulaic thing where like, okay, every, every expansion we have the new Mage Tower. Mm -mm. Uh, I think it's important that there be a good reason for it, that there be something exciting to reward from doing it, that it kind of fits into the, into the context of the world. But we're definitely not done with that type of solo challenge. I think it was a huge success, a ton of fun, and yeah. we want to do it again. Yeah, people and we... It's fun, like, 
It's funny, like, the, the Mage Tower was a huge success. The Mage Tower was the only thing really in BF in, in Legion. There was no easy mode for the Mage Tower, right? I mean, like, you could wait and get better gear. Yeah, you could do that. But there wasn't, like, you still fought the same enemy. You still, every single person fought Agatha. They fought Archmage Xylem. And he had the same amount of health. The only difference was what that person did for their own character. The success of the Mage Tower goes against the entire philosophy that they've been designing the game around. Like, whenever you think about it, it's completely fucking true. There's no easy mode. There's no catch-up mechanism, really. I mean, you can get better gear, but you have to go earn that gear. Every single success that the Mage Tower has goes completely against the philosophy that they've been designing a game around. And I think they should keep that in mind. I loved it. it really, I don't know, it just felt like a good thing to do something for your character and just solo stuff. It, it's exactly. Cool. Um, you announced Heroic Warfronts at BlizzCon for 8.2. Can oh, you yeah. tell us a little bit more about the difference to the normal mode? For us, Warfronts are an interesting concept, but to be honest, they're just they're too easy and too straightforward yes. every time yeah. to be fun. Mm -hmm. And um, we don't think it's even possible to lose a match. I, I don't really know if, if it, it, it is. It is possible. It's happened. It's unlikely. I mean, the, okay. the Warfronts <laughs> experience that you have on live today is really, it's, it's basically like an LFR encounter. Right, it's a large. It's effectively yeah. looking for raid, and that's the audience, and that's the tuning. As we explained at BlizzCon, I think the gist of heroic warfronts war is to create, you know, the normal raid experience that is designed for a pre-made group that is coordinating and turn that into something that a group of friends can do together. Is okay. it going to be a super challenge for a mythic raid group? No, that's that's not you know that's not something that we're trying to do here. But we want. Why not? Why the fuck not, Ian? Why the fuck not can it be a 40-man warfront where you're aided with NPCs and allies of your faction, where you have to overwhelm the other faction and defeat them, and you can do this once every single rotation, and it gives you an item or maybe even a token you can turn in for a 415 item level version of a piece of gear from the 7th Legion. Why the fuck not? Why not have it be something like AV? Why not? Oh, you're so afraid that maybe people will want to do this. Yeah, they will. Make it 20 man. If they want to do 40 man, fine. Fuck it. Don't do 40 man. Make it 20 man. Why not take the Warfront idea and go balls to the fucking wall with it and say, here's something that's difficult for mythic raiding guilds. Have fun. Because the servers are crashed with 40 people. to make it a more involved coordinated experience yeah and we'll have a ton more information to share on that again as rise of ashara actually imagine like all right you've got your fucking boys it's like bill all right you get the wood all right bill and the boys are gonna get the wood me and tim are gonna go over here and we're gonna get the 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 uh the copper in the mine and then oh we've got to have ted up there that's holding the defenses and you have everybody inner coordinating you have these like little miniature like fucking micro expedition groups like you're rambo and you're on a secret fucking mission and you're all coming together to work together against the horde and it's actually fucking hard it's difficult to do like, those are the types of content that Warfronts can create, not this LFR garbage where the fucking lead game designer has to clarify that it's even possible to lose the fucking game. It hits PTR and we move our attention there. Um, so that's, you know, just wanted to clarify what we set up BlizzCon. Okay, so maybe my next question would Triggered? be irrelevant yeah. because um, you haven't announced a new Warfront for patch 8.2 yet. Will there be no one in this update in the upcoming one? Um, we are we are we are not planning on a new warfront okay, okay. Uh, in in Rise of Ashara, but heroic warfronts will be what fills that vacuum. Okay, right? can you say something about the barons, for example? We heard about some time ago. There was a speculation that mm -hmm. barons might be a new warfront at some point, and yeah. Oh, 
there were, that was that was a very very that's not a thing we have planned that was a very early internal prototype when we were first beginning development on battle for azeroth um, before we had any of the new areas to to play with um some designers tried some of these concepts out in the barons uh, okay so barons warfront confirmed boys all right here we go this is gonna be awesome some, you know, most of that stuff was taken out because it was never never even made it to alpha it was okay. just an internal test but there were some you know some strings and some pieces of it that were still data mined so well, it that, that, that's the it was interesting to write, to write about because everyone was like, there is a new Warfront and we heard something and stuff like that. And, Were they really yeah. that excited? Um, do you have any further plans for crafting? Because we think we've never heard a single player saying uh, World of Warcraft has a good progression, uh, profession system. <laughs> it's really boring. I, I don't want to say boring like in a negative... It is. So here's what they could do. Blizzard, listen. Clip this. Here's what you guys do. Here's how to make professions vi viable and, and relevant. So you take the, these items right here, and you double the Sanguicel cost, and maybe uh, remove like the Explosive cost, something like that. And that makes the old raids relevant, and you make the items that you can craft BOE instead of BOP. That way it creates an economy, and also at the same time incentivizes people to do old raids. So that, that, that's it. Easy. Just go do that, it'll be fine. That's one one simple solution. Way, but I, I understand. Mm -hmm. And some would even say it's useless because there are a lot of bind on uh, pickup items, no real perks or even rare re recipes. And there are a lot of games out there with good examples for a better crafting system. Do you have anything like... It's, it's an area we're always looking to improve. Um, nothing, nothing specific to share right now. But I think historically... The most successful crafting professions in World of Warcraft, I think, have always been the ones that sell consumable trade skills. Like, I think alchemy works pretty well. Alchemy and herbalism or enchanting, where you feel like, yeah, you're creating potions and flasks. And there's a steady demand for these. You can use them yourself. You share them with your guild. You can make a lot of money selling them on the auction house. I yeah. think blacksmithing, leatherworking, tailoring have always been the more challenging ones because the gear they create always competes with every other source of gear in the game. Mm. And... The big challenge there is, well, if you can get crafted gear that's better than raid gear or equal to raid gear routinely, then just go to like you just go to the auction house with a lot of gold and buy a full set of crafted gear, and now you don't need to raid. And now... it's not even true. Wait, that that's not it's not even true. Like because you, when when were you able to buy an entire set of crafted gear? Never. The only time that you were able to do that was in WAD, ironically, after they changed the system. Because every single piece had a crafted alternative. You were never able to do that. TBC tailoring? No, you weren't. Unless you considered all of the pieces, including like tier 5 and tier 6, and combined them all together, maybe you could pretty much have a full set. You could never do this. It's not even true. You're just as strong as any other endgame player. Or if they're weaker, then, well, now crafting feels useless. Um... So, I mean, part of what we've tried to do there historically is you know, some bind on pickup items that require materials from dungeons and raids. It's been the case going all the way back to Burning Crusade. We see people now, you know, in the new Tides of Vengeance season going in to, you know, get their title cores and try to craft their and new, the new recipes and pieces. Stuff like that. Exactly. Um, but there, there's a lot of, we see that as an area with a ton of opportunity for improvement. You know, I think the possibilities for progression and really the fantasy of being a blacksmith and having that be yeah. something that you feel like you can specialize in and you can actually be a better blacksmith than other blacksmiths because Fuck yeah of that effort and that dedication that's something that we, we agree we're definitely falling short on and we'd like to do better in the future okay. that's what they used to have in vanilla like remember people i don't know if you guys ever played vanilla wow like burning crusade but there are people that used to put in chat like Level 300, level 375, whatever, 450, blacksmith looking for work, LFW, and they would link all of the different, because that was back before you could link the profession itself and you could see what the person can make. So they would actually just type out all their best things. So like, yeah, I can fucking do fiery enchant. Yes, I can make the lion heart helm. Yes, I can craft the molten core fire resist gear. And you would have that person make your gear. And it created trust, right? Because if that person's going around stealing people's gear and shit, people are going to spam about it and they're going to run out of work because nobody's going to want to play with them anymore, right? And they're going to, for scamming. Like, these were systems, like, the problem is, like, I don't need to look at these, like, divine inspirations of things that the game could have. All I need to do is remember whenever they already had them in the past. 
I, I don't want to be like, you know, like there's a video yesterday, but that guy said, he's like, you know, I, I don't want to look forward to the past happening again. Well, let, let's think of something new too. But first we need to get back to where we were. Okay, cool. Hey, just uh, real quick, sorry to interrupt, um, but we're pretty much out of time at this point. Um, if we got time for one more quick question. Sure. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, in terms of sound, zone design and atmosphere, Kulturas and Sanda are just beautiful. It's it's really awesome to see burrows at night, for example, or walking in Stormsong Valley with the sun rises, and it, it's pretty cool. Seeing okay. this and traveling back to classic or the old zones just... Uh, it feels like we are playing a complete different game. And um, if we yep. just see Arathi Highlands and Darkshore uh, and the overhaul of those zones, it's pretty cool. And um, can we get uh, more of these ramps? <laughs> this re ramps? Sorry. I, I mean, we, it, it, when you say it's like playing a different game, to, to, to a large extent, it almost is, right? It's You're going back to things that were made literally 10 years ago in a lot yeah. of cases. And the new zones always, you know, they showcase the improvements in technology and the way yeah. in which our art has just continued to push itself forward. Um, the, the big challenge, as we saw in Cataclysm, redoing an old zone is a large, it's a very large undertaking. People get it mad, It takes away too. from resources that could go into making brand new content for the end game. And so it's not something we can just say, okay, we're going to, we're just going to do this. Uh, we're always looking for reasons to do it. We're always looking for excuses. You know, I think the second, anytime we're setting a meaningful piece of new content in the old world, we're going to want to go back and update the fidelity, make it look better, make it look like it fits better into the modern game. That's what we saw with Darkshore. That's what we saw with Arathi. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised to see us continuing that treatment to select zones where it makes sense. And maybe over time, a larger portion of that old world feels more consistent with the modern okay. one. But I, it, I, it's good. hard to imagine me in any time in the near future saying, well, OK, instead of making new zones for a new expansion we're going to take this time and just go back and make westfall look cooler <laughs> i don't i don't think that's i don't think that would be in players best interests overall no, no i don't think no that's well, but yeah we are really like i actually I, I i like how they do the new zones and everything and like that's cool but uh, to an extent like i don't want them to like that's what happened in cataclysm like cataclysm like for me cataclysm was awesome because i did all of those old quests and everything because i was like a completionist if i wasn't a completionist that if i didn't care about that kind of stuff i would have hated cataclysm liking the new zones and the new stuff you did for the two zones awesome right. very glad to hear cool. um thanks for your time and thanks for the interview it was really great to talk to you <laughs> no it was and, a pleasure um, thank, thank you so much these are really great questions i really appreciate it cool that's nice. I, I would say that was a good interview overall. Um, yeah, I mean, everybody in here is pretty positive. Yeah, should I see it? Yeah, this is a good, good interview. Just goes better and harder content. Well, it, I don't know. I just feel like it's so crazy how the things that, no, that Blizzard but... says is like the, the, like they want people to like, they, everybody needs to complete the content, right? Or whatever. And like the Mage Tower goes against all of that. And it's like super successful and they think that it, it it's good. Like, obviously, it doesn't mean they should design all content with that philosophy in mind. But, I mean, I'd say most people, uh, or at least a lot of people that I that I talk to, at least, say the Mage Tower is one of their favorite parts about Legion. And it's like, make more content that's designed with that philosophy. It, it's like they went back 10 years in the past with the Mage Tower, and it was one of the most successful features of the game. And from my perspective, like, you think I would do community runs for Tyrezus or these other shitty fucking alts that I had if there wasn't a mage tower? Fuck no, I wouldn't care. Why would I give a shit? It doesn't matter to me at all. The only thing that I did it for was to get the gear for the mage tower. So it actually created more content. It gave people a reason to get better. And whenever you think about it, there was nothing in Legion besides that that challenged players to get better or get the fuck out because there's always an lfr or an easy mode alternative to everything else you see what i'm saying